Hello and welcome. My name is Sigurd Neubauer and I'm the founder and publisher of Man and Culture. Today it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Michael Vigel, the uh, research director at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs and adjunct professor at the University of Tampere. Today we're discussing Finnish defense policies, its strategic partnership with Sweden and Norway, and its potential application to join NATO. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Sigurd. It's, it's really good to be here. Many observers and analysts um, are, for obvious reasons, speculating on whether Finland and Sweden will be joining NATO because of the growing threat Russia's war in Ukraine presents to Europe and to the Nordic states in particular. But before we discuss Finland's potential NATO application and the process that would lead up to it, let's begin our conversation by focusing on the traditional foreign policy from its declaration of independence in 1917 to World War II and the Cold War. Yeah, so, I mean, Finland got its independence in 1917 uh, in a moment when Russia and the Soviet Union was amidst a lot of chaos. You know, there was a Russian revolution and Finland sort of seized the moment to become independent from Russia. The communists at the time in the Soviet Union probably thought that they could get Finland back and they tried to instigate chaos and revolution into Finland as well. And Finland actually... This was almost successful, this sort of Soviet hybrid interference and subversive methods in that Finland then fought a civil war in 1918. But to the, against the communist vicious, it was the white side, so to speak, the, the bourgeoisie who, who won the civil war. So Finland maintained its independence and its democracy in that time. But then, of course, in 1938, following the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between the Soviet Union, Stalin's Soviet Union, and Nazi Germany, where they carved up sort of Europe into spheres of interest, and and Finland was sort of given to the to the Soviet side. The Soviet Union tried to invade, attacked Finland, and tried to invade Finland in 1938. And this is considered a very heroic moment in Finnish history because Finland fought off. The, the big and mighty Soviet Union. And we maintained our independence through that war, even though we had to give away some territories. And of course, there's now a lot of analogies to the Ukraine situation. And there's been a lot of kind of talk about the, the heroic Finnish winter war and comparing it with the current Ukraine effort to fight off uh, Russian invasion. And there's there are a lot of comparisons to be made. And certainly the will to fight shows uh, itself to again be very decisive, even when a Soviet Union or a Russia has very much more military capabilities. The will to fight for your own country and territory, it's so decisive in warfare. We saw it in winter war and we see it again. But going back to the Finnish sort of history, Finland fought another war uh, during the, the Second World War from 1941 to 1944 with Soviet Union. And again, it fought off Soviet Union. Finland maintained its interdependence. But this second sort of war with the Soviet Union is not considered as heroic because we, in that war, because it was a long one, a protracted conflict, we sort of had to ally ourselves with Nazi Germany in order to get material help. So we need a lot of equipment and defensive material, which we got only from Germany then. So the, the peacemaking was then a bit of a difficult page for, for Finland because the terms were really hard for the peace deal. And we were left in a very kind of position of loneliness, so to speak, with the Soviet Union having a border of 1,300 kilometers to the Soviet Union and no allies at the time. So Finland had to thread a very careful balancing act during the whole of the Cold War, which really entailed being very careful not to provoke the Soviet Union, while at the same time trying to integrate itself as much as possible in a westernly direction, but without that being seen as provocative from a Soviet perspective. So that's why also Nordic cooperation became so important for Finland, because that was a sort of unprovocative way to integrate with the Western world, to integrate with Sweden, Norway, Denmark, without, of course, integrating with, with NATO or, or European institutions at the time, which could have been seen as a provocation from the Soviet Union side and Finland trying to remain independent and not becoming part of the Soviet bloc had indeed to thread a very careful neutral line.
And when would you say that uh, the process for Finland started to integrate itself uh, further with the Nordic uh, countries, both diplomatically, strategically, and of course, uh, culturally? Well, it really started in the 50s already and, and accelerated through towards the end of the 50s and the 1960s. And, and, you know, coming up to the 1970s, I think the Nordic region was quite integrated already. It was one of the most integrated regions in the in the world. And it was at this time that the Nordics really got together and, and we, we really have this kind of Nordic model, which is, of course, you know, quite famous in the world, world right now with the Nordics being quite similar in many ways. And that really took place in those 20, 20, 25 years there around the 60s and 70s. So looking for a fast forward, only weeks before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Finland formally announced that it would acquire the F-35 and Norway is already a member of the Joint Strike Fighter Program and where Sweden obviously is not because Sweden has its own program. Can you please help us understand Finland's strategic rationale for joining the Joint Strike Fighter while at least until the outbreak of the war in Ukraine uh, was committed to adhering to its neutrality based foreign policy doctrine? You know, I think it's a it's a large misunderstanding that Finland would adhere to any neutrality based foreign policy doctrine. I think Finland hasn't been neutral since 1995 when Finland joined the European Union. And, and this is, you know, the, the official line is that Finland is certainly not neutral, but that we're militarily non-aligned. And militarily non-aligned does not the same as being neutral. Finland has had, has and has had for a long time very close military partnerships with a number of other countries in the Western world. So our defense cooperation with Sweden goes back a long while and it's extremely close. It involves everything from very close exercising together, military planning, defense planning, intelligence sharing, you name it. Everything but, you know, security guarantees, so to speak, or a formal military alliance. And this has been extended in the in the last years also to Norway. There's closer and closer trilateral cooperation, defense cooperation between Finland, Sweden, and Norway. Finland is part of the so-called JEF, the Joint Expeditionary Force, which is very much kind of led by the UK and also taking part, you know, the Nordic countries, Baltic countries take part in that defense and military cooperation. Finland of course, has been one of the very active member states in pushing forward the European Union's common security and defense policy. And Finland has very close cooperation with NATO and has had for some time already. I think Finland and Sweden actually are more compatible with NATO than many actual current NATO members. So can, Finland, you, can, can you explain what you mean by that? I mean that our weapon systems, our command structures, our defense planning are very compatible with NATO and Finland has been taking part in lots of NATO summits already and different meetings. We are very much part of the civil defense planning side of the NATO structure already. You know, a NATO membership for Finland is really a, actually a pretty small step because we're militarily strategically so compatible already. And Finland, of course, has a long-standing bilateral cooperation with the United States on the military side. I mean, the F-35 program that you were taking up, this is really a continuation of our present current program of uh, F-18s. Finland already uses the American F-18s. We got them in the beginning of the 90s already. So all of these different military cooperative networks that Finland has based its security and defense policy on, this has been going on for some time already. It certainly doesn't make us neutral. It's questionable whether we can even be, call ourselves a military non-aligned because we have these very deep cooperations going on already. So, you know, a step to NATO membership is really not that long of a step. It's really quite uh, more of a continuation of existing corporations. That said, it is, of course, a big change in the sort of identity for Finland from the Cold War, where we certainly were very focused on the sort of neutrality doctrine. Uh, it's a change from that, of course, but in current circumstances, it's not really a, a, such a big step.
So given that all the puzzle pieces have already been laid and the groundwork is already in place from what you described towards a NATO accession, let's talk a little bit about the domestic angle to NATO membership in Finland. How are the various political parties divided or aligned on, on this issue? Well, first of all, Finnish public opinion has changed completely and very rapidly since the Russian invasion and attack on Ukraine. You know, going back a year or so, there were about 25-30% for a NATO membership, 35% against and, and you know, 30% on decisives. Now that has shifted completely. Around 70% of Finns are for NATO membership. And this has changed in the matter of a couple of months because it's seen as such a big change to the security environment in Europe that Russia really went for invading Ukraine and a very brutal way in which it is doing it. In our parliament, there has also been this change, which reflects the change in public opinion. Almost all major parties, let's say, are now more or less in favor of NATO membership. On the left flank, there's a party, which is part of the coalition government at the time being, which is more hesitant on NATO membership. But even the left party is not willing to quit a government because if there's a decision on applying for NATO membership. So it really it really shows the amount of the consensus, how broad and strong and deep the consensus at the time being in Finland is for joining NATO. So and that that obviously, as you said, um, that uh, extends throughout the parliament from the left flank to to the right flank. And because picking up there, you you had mentioned also that, that there were two attempts to uh, ignite a civil war in Finland in 1918 and during the 1940s uh, by, by the Soviets. Do you, uh, do you foresee any potential that these old wounds could be opened up or that, that the Russians could attempt to open them up? We're certainly in Finland expecting Russian attempts to try to affect and use different kinds of subversive means to affect public opinion, to affect our decision making on this issue. That's clear. I mean, Finland expects sort of hybrid threats on the, on the one hand, which would involve disinformation. It may involve subversive means in the way of trying to instigate protest movements. It may in even involve certain targeted violence against some members of the establishments or specific symbolic targets within Finland. It certainly might involve, or we are expecting, uh, cyber attacks against Finland, for instance, the Finnish electric grid. And we're expecting some military posturing, military threats. But none of these are such that it will affect the Finnish either public opinion or decision-making in the end. I think the consensus and the determination of the Finns right now are so strong that any such threats or military posturing would actually only strengthen the commitment and to really go for, for NATO membership. So I, I don't really think that there are much that Russia can do to affect the situation in Finland right now. And remembering that Russia is very occupied in Ukraine at the time being. So Russia has around 80-85% of its own land forces are committed to Ukraine at the time being. So we don't really in Finland foresee any of the kind that Ukraine unfortunately is suffering through right now. We don't foresee that Russia has any capability of actually trying to invade or attack conventionally, militarily, Finland. And also taking into consideration that Finland has very strong armed forces. I mean, the Finnish armed forces are one of the strongest in the whole of Europe, which goes back to sort of the, the lessons from the wars that Finland fought with the Soviet Union and the, sort of our, our situation throughout the Cold War, that there is always this risk with Russia. And there have been this quite pragmatic and realistic view of Russia all the time. So Finland really never went the way that many European countries went of weakening its, its armed forces and, and putting resources to other things and, and only focusing on peacekeeping operations. Finland has very much kept intact its territorial 
and total defense doctrines, which, you know, in the 90s was a bit of a, of a joke almost in Europe because other, other ones saw that, well, why do you keep such strong arm force? What do you need them for? Because the, the thought at the time was that we were going towards peaceful integration with Russia and peaceful relations will remain. But Finland has always taken a bit more of a realistic view to keep safe and, and, and you know, to make sure if something, the development doesn't go that peaceful in Russia, that we really are prepared. So the level of military and civil preparedness in Finland has been kept very high. So at the time being, we don't really foresee any conventional uh, large scale possibility of Russia attacking Finland in the way that it, it's it's doing now with Ukraine. And in that sense, I see very few obstacles to uh, a, a NATO membership for Finland or, or Sweden, actually. The only yeah. sort of obstacle that I do foresee a bit might have to do with the ratification process that 30 current NATO members need to ratify a Finnish membership. And there might be some potential trouble ahead, even though I don't foresee them, because I think almost all NATO members have come out very clearly in favor of uh, Finnish NATO membership. Does that include, let's say, uh, Hungary? I think our the Finnish president spoke with the Hungarian leadership a while back, a week back or so, and uh, got very clear indication of Hungary also being in favor, or at least not putting any obstacles, not vetoing potential NATO membership. So really all signals so far from present NATO members have been that the NATO open door policy is intact and that Finland and Sweden are welcome. And what would that process entail? Should and will Finland apply for, for membership? So I foresee that Finland and Sweden will go together here, filing for membership in late May already. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that Finland and Sweden do this together because Finland and Sweden, and together with Norway and Denmark, form a sort of common geostrategic area up in Northern Europe. And we don't want to have any, you know, gray spots there. Then if, if Finland would apply and Sweden, or Finland would become members, Sweden would not. I mean, that would put Sweden in a bit of a difficult position. It would also put Finland as a sort of Northeastern flank in NATO. It would be more difficult to defend Finland if Sweden would not be there. So it's really strategically very important that, that Finland and Sweden do, do this together. And I think they will. I think they will file for membership late May, early June at the latest. Then we have the big NATO summit in Madrid, late June. I think from there on, you know, the process will go pretty fast. The NATO as an organization will have no qualms about accepting Finland and Sweden. Negotiations with NATO will be very easy because NATO and Sweden, as I said, are very compatible already with NATO. And then the ratification process starts, right? In the summer, when 30 NATO member countries will have to ratify the membership of Finland and Sweden. I expect that to go relatively smooth at this point, but there is, of course, always the risk that Russia tries to interfere with those ratifications. So even though I'm saying that Finland and Sweden are well prepared for any threats from Russia and that it will not in any way change Finland's and Swedish views, you know, Russia might affect other countries that are currently members of NATO. Russia Does might Turkey, try to drive a wedge. Do you think yeah. that, um, that uh, Russia could try to uh, put a wedge between NATO and Turkey on this issue during the ratification process, potentially? I think that Russia will at least try to drive a wedge within NATO during this ratification process. From a Kreml's perspective, that that would make sense. We know that there are some issues between some fissures, let's say, between sort of south and north of NATO. In the north, uh, countries are, of course, very well welcoming of Finland and Sweden because it strengthens NATO's northern flank very much. And Finland and Sweden brings a lot of 
strong military capabilities into the alliance. But looking at from the south, uh, of course, NATO membership will look less urgent in, in a way from, from their perspective. And, and Finland has a long border with Russia, so it might look a bit different from there. And then there's the possibility that the Russia will try to exploit that and drive a wedge through NATO. Whether it will be targeted against Turkey, I'm not sure. I mean, President Erdogan of Turkey has come out very much in favor of NATO's open door policy. So I'm not sure if Russia will be very effective in, in, in trying to influence the Turkish ratification process. Russia may try to influence other countries such as Greece, Italy, Spain. Also there, I don't think Russia will be successful in the end. It's a matter of the you know credibility and legitimacy of NATO as an organization to be open to new members and to Sweden and Finland joining them. So I think it will be seen as very urgent, in fact, very important to let Finland and Sweden in. My very last question for today, Michael, is some observers have said that Sweden would follow Finland, but Finland is taking the lead. You are arguing the opposite, which is, if I understood you correctly, that Sweden and Finland not only would coordinate their moves, but apply jointly. Is that is that how I understand it correctly? Exactly. There is a lot. There is a lot of coordination between Finland and Sweden on this issue. There is broad understanding in both Finland and Sweden that we're doing this together. That there's a lot of strategic rationale in coordinating. So I I foresee that it will be a coordinated effort, and Finland and Sweden will go hand in hand, so to speak, take the same at the same time, the same steps. Thank you so much, Michael, for being with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.